money, Jordan Belfer. Stacking penny stocks while I'm flipping these birds. Sipping on Ciroc, trip them up with the words. I done popped the molly and I think it's be my third. What is going on, DJ Nation? Kenny Kim here bringing you another Fantasy Golf Generate uh, podcast this week. For the 3M Open, 3M Classic, I don't even know what it's called. It's such a letdown after these majors. The 3M something. We're going to be talking about golf. That's our job. That's what we're going to do. As usual, I am here with Tyler Tambley, everyone's favorite Canadian. Tyler, what is up, my friend? <laughs> what is up? It's always going to be a good week when you forget the name of the tournament coming in. We should go back and check our results for those weeks. I think they're probably some of the better weeks because you it's actually don't care. It's been happening a lot more frequently here <laughs> recently than it had in the past. I can tell you yeah, that. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. We'll, we'll bring you guys in. Before we get into it, I want to remind everyone very quickly, this show is brought to you and presented by FantasyNational.com. Head on over to fantasynational.com slash FGD. Get yourself 20% off your first payment outside of a major. So if you did the annual now, it would get you through till next year, all the majors included, something like that. So check that out if you guys want to check that. For We're using all those stats for this week. Kenny, the mullet man came through. Uh, you know, John Daly 2.0, the old course, everything. It was an incredible week. I absolutely loved it. Uh, right down to the last second, just some incredible stuff from Cam Smith, obviously. But what do you want to talk about here first? 12 putts on the back nine of a major. <laughs> I mean, uh, while you're in contention, the final nine holes on a Sunday of a major and you put the ball 12 times. Yeah. That's unbelievable. I mean, the thing is that you see it. I think it's harder to do that than, you know, a lot, than have a great ball striking final round because you see that pretty often with these guys, but the, but the, you know, where your nerves really get to you is on the putting green when you're when you're on the flat stick for him to do what he did for Cam to do what he did uh I mean it was uh, unbelievable uh the way uh he putted you haven't seen that in a while it's happened before don't get me wrong but you see more you see less of these amazing putting performances to win an event uh on Sunday you see that less than then say a ball striking performance is top notch uh, because I think it just takes a lot more. There's so much more pressure, uh, you know, to do what he did was so amazing. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it was just, anyways, 64 on, on the final round of any major uh, is pretty incredible. Now the course, we'll talk about the course here uh, in a little bit, but good for him. Solid and feel bad for Rory uh, to, to go, you know, hit every green in regulation and not three putt. You know what I'm saying? Uh, at all uh, on Sunday while you were in the lead and you lose by three strokes. Uh, yeah, it's pretty tough for him. He just he couldn't make a putt um, at all. It was a total role reversal. I mean, you know, Cam would miss sometimes. He'd be putting the the approach the 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 chip, not the chip, the putt on 17 was so sick to get that within like 12, yeah. 15 feet when he missed it when he missed. The, the, the green short-sided with a bunker in front of him, maybe 10 feet of room to work with. And he hits the only shot he could have hit to get it close, that slingshot putt to go around, get it up, left it pin high, 12-foot putt, straight in the hole, so sick. And then Cameron Young, what a great week by him. That eagle on 18, I really wanted a three-way playoff. Uh, you know, going, I was hoping Cam uh, Smith would miss that, uh, that little, 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 four footer he had left on 18 for the birdie just so we could have a chance of a three-man four-hole aggregate playoff which would have been unbelievable uh yeah it was, it was sunday was amazing it was one of the best rounds of golf i've seen this year what, what about you yeah i think we're i've got my notes perfect because i think it's going to be cam smith rory the course and, and you were hitting on all of those so we're going to tie it all together here and come back to it but i do think a couple things that you said one the putting performance like you mentioned it can happen we can, you can see it happen at certain tournaments at the 150th open at the old course with the pressure on the line. And look, the cliche thing said about Rory, which we'll segue to in a minute, is I think true. What they said, his exact quote after, I love Rory because he leaves his heart on his sleeve, said, I didn't really do anything wrong. I just, you know, it just didn't work out right for me. Like it didn't, not anything went, nothing went right. And especially with that putter. And I'm not saying it was the nerves because who knows, it's Rory. But the point was, it, they, no matter what any of them said, there's nerves out there. Rory's talking about the night before in his hotel room, seeing the big screen, looking up, expecting his name. And that's what you should do. Dreamer. That makes sense. I love all that. But when you talk about it from the aspect of the Cam Smith side of things, he still had to go and execute it and do it. 
And you go back to a couple of things. Like, it's just crazy to think back now, like um, the Masters, the November Masters. And that ties in with the course factor, which we're about to talk about. And the Masters thing came through, I, I guess, you know, yeah, this, in speaking of that year, DJ, Rory, Cam Smith, all in the top five with DJ winning it. They were all up in the mix at this tournament with the easier scoring, a little bit baked out, all those factors. But that's an aside. The bigger factor for me was like, you go back there. Remember he was in there. And they were talking about all four rounds under 70 and how that's never happened. And people were putting asterisks on it. And for whatever reason, sure. Augusta national doesn't usually play at that time of year, that way, that type, but still the fact that he just continues to go out and do it now and won the players in a completely different way, right? You just got to respect that. That's an absolute incredible game. He was asked that question after amidst the live question, which we'll leave out today, but he was asked that question about a sort of, how do you think they play the same? He said, they don't at all. And then they said, well, then what does that say about you? And he says exactly what I think it says about me is that, you know, that's where my game is at right now. I'm established. I'm ready to go. I can win at any time. I can adapt. And man, you just got to wonder what he's got left in the tank for some of these other ones going into next year. So awesome way for him to end out the season. Rory, like you said, you talk about 12 putts, Cam Smith, the whole 17, just an incredible, sh- you know, set up there after a poor shot to be able to find the fix. But Rory, just unfortunate, man, could not find it. It's just crazy. He did that. And it wasn't even a playoff. Like it just, Cam Smith just went off and took it. So, of uh, course, what do you, what do you want to talk about? Go, go ahead with Rory and then anything you want to talk about on the course. Yeah, well, when it comes to the course, you know, I, it, I was sort of right in my course preview. I mean, a lot of bombing, not, you know, a lot of wedges, um, you know, not iron play. Didn't really need to be good at it because you weren't hitting many irons. You know, you were bombing it out there, chipping it, and then, you know, hopefully two putting for, Uh, or bombing it out there two putting for birdie we saw that a lot (laughs) this past week there's one bomb on a par four two putts you know make your birdie or get it up and down make your birdie the thing about it is you've seen it at the old course we i talked about it last week how the scoring has always been low pretty much lower than any other major that you'll see uh at any other event uh, has happened at the road at the, at the old course. And you see it now with this new technology, this new aggressive mindset of golfers, you know, every time it comes back here there, it's going to be like this, unless, especially if the weather's benign, but it was still good watching, yeah. uh, you know, for, 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 for a course, I don't, I don't mind it coming back every five to seven years, first off, because of the tradition, because of the history you know what I'm saying? And, and, and because of the finishes that we get, even though it's not necessarily the most difficult thing that we've seen out there, the course is going to play without when the course is going to play easy uh, for these pros. It, it, it's almost a pitch in a putt, uh, you know, you know, bomb and gouge uh, type deal that we see so much on the regular PGA tour, but with nuances, uh, you know, with, with, because the best part about links golf is around the green. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, trying to maneuver the mounds and the humps and everything. Putting off and, the road. Yeah, guys are yeah. putting up over mounds on things. And, and, and the like, way yeah. these guys played it, it brought that even more into play than I think usual because they're hitting the, there's drivers so close that they're, they're, they're chipping basically uh, on every second shot uh, on those short par fours. And so you get to see a lot of that, well, uh, you know, that, that, that finesse, that skill, that imagination, you get, you still get to see it. You just don't get to see many irons being hit out there. You know, it's just drive and then short game, drive and then short game. It was okay. I, I don't, I don't mind it. Uh, you know, I, I don't want it to be like that every single year at the open championship, but that's why they have a rotation uh, because of the history. I can get down with it. The course played fine. It's going to play easy every time they play this course. If there's no weather, it's just the way it's going to be. Um, and uh, easy compared to other majors. How about that? Maybe uh, no. I was going to say, you have to frame that up because I got to step in like that to me. Yeah. I, it was too much of that talk. I thought Ben Coley was just dropping the hammer on everyone on Twitter saying like, it's not that it's not as easy as what you're saying. It is the par number comes into play. The second point is like, look, we got to the 20 under number, which people all week, including us were estimating 18 to 20, maybe with no wind, no weather. And then maybe it falls off. It's pretty much what everyone said. And that's what happened. T four and below was 14. There was no wind. Like there was almost no conditions. I know there was slight in the afternoon, but you get my point for this course, Mm -hmm. for this place, it still took Cam Smith 64 on Sunday to hit 20. And after Mm -hmm. that, there was only two guys that were there with them. And then nobody in sight. Most guys shot 11 or 10 under over four days with no conditions. 
The U S open is why we have that for a reason. I thought this course was perfect. And I loved it because 17 was just a prime example. It wasn't just because he could bomb it out there and do his thing. It was that you still had to know what to do. He had to have a plan to get around that bunker. Then you have to go and execute the putt where, you know, this could cost you the tournament down the line. Like that shot would have been a playoff. If he doesn't make that, I mean, again, butterfly effect, if you will, that that doesn't go, then maybe something else goes different. Who knows? But the point is more, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't ask for something better. Honestly, if there was wind, sure. Makes it that much better. I, I, again, it goes with the tradition, the look. The well, if, if it's wind, it changes the whole, if there's 30, 35, sure. 30, 35 mile per hour winds like there oftentimes is at the open championship. Yo, you're looking at, you know, minus five. I, I personally as the loved, winning score, you know, I personally loved what it provided. I know you did too. I'm not arguing you. I'm just saying in it. general, a lot of people brought it up on Twitter. Like, Oh, it's so easy. This uh, I, to me, it didn't suck. Like I, I, actually I liked thought it. the way that the people are playing golfers are playing it now actually made it more exciting. There was because interesting it, it, stuff it, it, because it, more it brought more short game than I think normal. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I mean, everybody's pounding it's, these drivers right. on these short par fours and they're getting it close to the green. And the best part of Lynx Golf to watch is the short game. It, so I'll tell you I, this, too. I thought, I thought it, it worked out perfect. Back, it still goes back to what we said last week, too. We brought up Andy Lack, right? We talked about him mentioning those bunkers. That was the other thing. You, it brought everything into play. That's what I was saying. It still goes back to the fact that it brought every shot into your game. Again, the guys had distance. The guys that were bombing it, it was great. It worked out. But the point was they still needed everything. You could bomb it go into a pot bunker, have to click it out. And then you had to make the iron shot. So, the, and use that short game to make sure it was bogey or, or less. Like you didn't, you didn't want to have bogey or worse. So obviously, so that's the whole point is that you really still had a lot of great shots brought into play a lot of good game. To me, it wasn't just drive it, hammer it up there that even then you still had to chip it up within the greens were fast enough that like yeah, the, yeah, yeah. it was, that's what firm enough. Is, but you got to admit a lot of people, it was a bomb gouch for a lot of players for the majority of the people out there that played this event, they were hitting driver three wood off the tee every, but then, but then why did they not all get to 20 under? Why did it take well, the be, guy that putted because, lights out? Well, because There's of no the best part about Lynx golf is the short game. And right. some people just aren't as good at it. You know what I'm saying? That to me now, is not bomb and gouge. That bomb and gouge is also when you can rip it up and just tear it apart. These guys couldn't do yeah, that. You see, can bomb I'm, it out I'm there. I'm talking about bomb and gouge yeah. based upon, not a uh, bomb and gouge on a, on like a Parkland type course, you're hitting at 380, but you still have like 120, 140 left on a lot of holes. You know what I'm saying? This course, you're bombing it out there. You got like 40 to 60. You got 20 to 60 yards. But you need the short 80. game to comp complement it. And, and that's why the event watched right, so amazing. well, because yeah. the short game is the best part of Lynx Golf watching it. It's the best part because you got those mounds, you got the putty, you, you got to be able to, to, to have that. That that like I said that uh, imagination uh, you have you know to, to play those shots if the wind blew just a little bit it would have been even greater uh, yeah. you know but I, I mean, wish it know. had wind but I honestly wasn't yeah. disappointed with but it like at all. no There's no no wind. wind this course people are going to drive the fuck out of it but it's still entertaining as shit to watch yeah uh, it's I just not like when it's not like your normal gouge, weekend. yeah but I don't care like what you're... it really means I'm saying I take it as if you tell me bomb and gouge there has to be the gouge part. If they really gouged this place, okay. we would have had a lot more guys 15 under. Bomb hours, and no chip. Win. Bomb and chip then. Bomb and you chip. You have to close. You have to close. It's like saying, oh, I got there. It's like I, I understand what the fuck win. you're saying. I understand right. what you're saying. But the way that it showed it, the way the game was played, people were pounding the fuck out of driver and they had a 60-yard shot. They had to do those 60-yard shot, shots well. They yeah. had to do them well. There's but no I, but that's what I love that. about majors, Kenny. It's the same. Even look, the U.S. Open is harder. And I like it better, actually, when you think about how it plays out versus how this played out. I still love this event, love being up late, love all that stuff. What I'm saying is I like about that. I still what I liked about this course and this week is that you you still needed your complete game. You could try and bomb it and go in a pot bunker and be screwed. You, you could make a mistake. Irons. You didn't need long irons. You didn't need mid irons. You needed driver you needed short irons you needed your wedge it it, it, it missed the long mid iron part of your game yeah because you just I don't, but i don't but i don't think we expected that i don't remember last week saying like i can't wait to see these oh, no, 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 yard no, iron I, I understand shots that. i understand it but like if you go to other major championships you know you're, you're going to have to use some mid iron play sure. some long iron play it, it might test a little bit more overall around of your game but that's why we have we four majors at, right and then we saw at the open championship yeah. but it but i think that was the best major of the year to watch i loved it personally I loved it. 
for me. That was the best major of the year to watch, even though everyone was pounding, you know, leaving themselves 60, anywhere between 20 or even on the green, either on the green, like 80 yards back Yeah, is what you saw on your second shot. That's what we saw. We do a quick rating now. Let's, let's get back and bring it in for the majors for the year. I'm with you. I thought that was, that was the best. The U S open was really strong too, in my opinion, with Willie Z coming down the stretch with the fist pumps. And we had more of a crew there ready to go, but I, you know, and Matty Fitz doing his thing, all that stuff. But um, the, the masters was actually the least exciting of the year. When you go back, nothing against Scotty Scheffler. I think he's still, by the way, uh, tournament player of the year, even with what, what cam has done. I still think it's Scotty, but either way, I'm just saying that to me was the least exciting because it kind of ended on hole 12 with, by the way, Cam Smith going in the water. So there was that. Uh, PGA, I get that it was exciting because JT came back and took the thing and it went to the playoff and all that. But really, to me, it wasn't like we saw that there was a chance those guys could fall back. It was like Mito, Willie Z, Cam Young trying to get their job done, trying to get the first major, in some cases, uh, first PGA Tour win. So I think that was the situation there. U.S. Open, I thought was good. But this, to me, was was my favorite ending, at least. Uh, again, I, don't, I thought it was good the whole time. I was good with it. But I, I really did like this one quite a bit. So what, what are your rankings or what are your thoughts? On yeah, that? I mean, like, uh, yeah, it, it's fine. It was my favorite. I don't, you know, I don't remember Augusta because that's when I had my stroke. The other two were fine, but this was by far the best. Yeah. Uh, you know, other golfers have played pretty well this week. Yeah, Fleetwood, top five, Lynx course, Cash Game Cornerstone. Cash Game Cornerstones went four for four this week. Uh, you know, uh, went six or six in cash. I think single digit six for sixes uh, in most uh, in most uh, GPPs and cash this week. So a pretty solid week there. Uh, the 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 uh, Bryson, another guy that I loved last week. Uh, you know, top ten up in there. DJ, another guy, big fan of top ten. Spieth, another top ten in a links course. Not surprising. Um, so you know, you, you had a lot of the your 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 normal people. Uh, up there, but one guy surprised me, Hovland. Um, you know, he, he, I, and the thing is, I think it's partly because he didn't have to chip that much the first three days because he was hitting every green in regulation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and these greens are so large, and he was hitting every every approach shot that he had was a wedge, uh, for the most part. Uh, you know, it, it, so it was pretty easy to try and avoid the chipping part. Uh, it's sort of burned them a little bit on Sunday, but not that badly. So, you know, I think open championship style, I think, you you know, when, seven years from now when Hovland's, what, 30? Hey, mark mark down that bet right there for Hovland because I think this course is perfect for the open championship win for Hovland. The other ones, we'll have to see, uh, you know, when it comes down to it because you're not – there's going to be – I think there's going to be a lot more missed greens uh, when the wind blows and there's no wind here. Uh, so it could have been sort of fluky for Hovland this week, but it was good seeing him up there. Uh, any other guys catch your eye? He, he was the hindsight guy. I'm glad you brought him up. The H and Hovland stands for hindsight. And a course like this with no wind, with the large greens, which oh, he's already a, a greens and regulation machine, usually a great ball striker. And if he's around the greens, he just can put it up tight and do that. Like to me, just in hindsight, that was a, a bad yeah. miss. Like yeah. I, I take that as a mistake on my end. So, um, you know, Bryson showing up was definitely interesting. And uh, again, you just talked about it being able to bomb and gouge, like you mentioned, but I still think it was more of that. I think he had a much more complete game and the stats show it too. You go across the board. He wasn't even uh, top five in the field and off the tee. Like he usually is. He was up there, but the point is it was everything else. He actually was solid on approach, solid around the greens. He actually didn't have a putter this week. Still did that on Sunday with a six under, like still had a couple things going for him that I just thought it was, he's a little healthier. Maybe he's a little happier. I don't know. Maybe that, you know, the fact that he was just able to uh, find his way around it. He was another guy, both him and Cam Young mentioned in their interviews, like you don't figure this course out. You just take what it gives you and hope that it goes your way. Maybe you'll learn 5%. I think Cam Young said you pick up 5% a day, uh, you know, or a day of each of the tournament, not for lifetime, but just saying you don't, you learn little new things every day, but you don't really ever know the whole course was kind of the saying, paraphrasing some. So before I move on, Tiger. What do you think? Can we look past this? Or is this a sign of maybe it's coming to an end? What do you think? Yeah. And and we did this. A lot of people did this last time with them. I know the, the iPads came out, Michael Jordan style, like last dance, where, you know, he took it personally, went out and shipped the Masters. But this is a different injury. I don't know, man. Like, it, did, it didn't look good. I know, you know, the awesome part was him. Like, it was an excellent scene, him running across the bridge to make sure they know it's not as final hurrah like he's hoping to get back eventually and get his thing we'll see him he, he said this week he's not going to retire i know those rumors were out there and things like that i guess 
you don't really retire from golf in hindsight because it's like, you know, he can come out and play. You do eventually, but he can always play the masters every year and get around that way. But I just, it didn't look good, man. Like, I don't know. And he had all the time. I wonder though, too, like, what do you think was the thought process around playing? I think they said he played 60 practice holes. Again, you have a cart involved. It's different, but I just felt like, you know, you had that, he had the, what's opposite of his usual wave. I thought for sure that meant like he's making the cut and he was happy to have some more rest going into the weekend. It was pretty bad. The the play was not good. So what, what no. were your thoughts or what did you take away? Uh, he didn't look great. He's still, you know, when walking, it still doesn't look a hundred percent. I don't know, man, a broken leg compound fracture. It's going to be tough for him to come back. I think he has one more run in him at, at a major. I think we'll see him in contention. I think you'll see him win one more. We'll never when count it happens, him out either, too. I I, when it that. happens, I don't know. But I, I, I think for the most part, he's not going to contend, except for that one. And I don't know what it's going to be, uh, but I, I just feel like it, one more run for Tiger is in the books sometime in the next three years. Uh, and so I, I think pick this next right year, too, him getting healthier, I think no matter what this turnaround, like it was, he came out and did the thing at the masters. He went to the PGA championship, had to withdraw after round three, obviously wasn't going to give the U S open a go with the, you know, the long walk, the longer holes just did not suit him at all. And he just had a WD, a major the month before. So I think the, the thing is next year will be much healthier coming into the masters that I could see giving the guy a shot. Again, that's a course, you know, you can get around. Like I honestly could see it. I, I what I was taking away is not the results and the stats and what we saw. I just think the leg is not healthy and and it's pretty clear. And again, going around playing 60 practice holes, cart or not going around, you know, doing all that. I I thought it was maybe too much, maybe just save it up and see how it goes. He put a lot. I felt like I think he's probably still trying to figure out what's too much because you know, he knows he needs the work. Yeah. Okay. You can't just go out there with not playing any golf at all. So he knew he needed the work and that's why he went out there and played those practice rounds. Maybe he thought his leg could hold up better. And it, and it just couldn't when he got, when he got to the too. course. I think like he learned. From and, it, you know, I think he'll be able to judge that better as time keeps going and the leg gets, get, keeps getting better and better. Yeah. Uh, now, do I see him being in contention? You know, every, I, do I see him coming back on tour? No. Do I see him being in contention at, at a bunch of majors? No. But one, maybe, maybe we get that one more run from Tiger before he goes off into the sunset. And that's, you know, he doesn't owe a shit. He can go out there and, suck ass every single fucking time he goes out there for the rest of his career that's fine too because it's tiger woods he did so much for the game that's fine too i'm just hoping for one more one more for tiger all right before we get into uh the listener league tambo i know you got some news about the listener league here coming up why don't you spread the news yeah we'll get to the winner in a second just want to remind everyone so obviously all season long we took all the winners we put them into the tournament of champions so we've got the date now so it's going to be for the Wyndham. We're going to put it alongside the Fantasy Golf World Championship live final. That's what's going on that week. It's 125, obviously the best on the in the FedEx Cup standings. Uh, the PGA Tour, if you don't know, revamped it over last season. So it is just three events now that they run back to back to back. It's that, the BMW, and then the Tour Championship. So it makes it, there's Wait. a little bit more motivation in round one than there used to be again not it doesn't mean everyone Wait, so you say we're going to the Wyndham or we're we going to sorry I meant to say I, I messed up there after the Wyndham is the FedEx St. Jude the first round of the playoffs with the so which one which one is the tournament of champions FedEx St. Jude to St. match Jude. alongside the live final reason being I know it's a little bit of a shorter event but it's not a no cut It's a 125, man. It's the best of the best on the season, which is what you guys are, the best of the best, all the winners of the Lister League. And then on top of it, it's still fair. Everyone's pretty motivated. The the downfall, like this week is the Fantasy Golf World Championship round one. Next week's round two, I'm playing in it. It's that you've got these tournament fields, like what we're about to talk about, where doesn't mean they're bad fields, doesn't mean there's not great strategy. We're going to bring that to you guys here. But I do think uh, it t- it's a little bit higher variance, right? When we run into it, anything can happen. There's a lot of water out there, eagles, all these factors that can change the scoring in a heartbeat. I think it's the best week to bring it to you guys. So we're going to get some good prizes, some good money, cash, things like that. We'll round up for you guys some gear, maybe as much as we can and try and have a lot of great prizes for you for that week. All right. That sounds good. The winner this past week's uh, listener league was Dr. Rico 13. I cannot tell what his avatar is. A spaceman? I don't know. My vision's not great. Still not back yet. All right. So winner, uh, he had Rory McIlroy, of course. Dr. Rico 13 did 27% own. Good work there, DJ Nation. 
Uh, he did not win. I'm sorry. He was in third place. Sorry. Mine's going a little bit crazy. The sleep schedule. I have to say, on from now on, so I took Thursday and Friday off, right? From now on, I got to take Monday off on uh, on Open Championship week because my sleep schedule was so jacked the whole weekend. And I just couldn't, I just could not make it at work today. And I've been struggling all you day. You can always work Thursday, Kenny, and just take Friday, Monday. Still only take two days, but Thursday, you don't miss that much. Like by the time, yeah, you, but the, you know, you, you're, I want to watch from the beginning. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. You can do. I, I got a I get two weeks PTO every week that carries over. So I ain't got to worry about that. All right. So then he had Cam Smith, the winner, 25% owned, uh, you know, 137 draft game points. Fleetwood, who came in fourth. Wow, what a lineup. Um, he was 18.72% uh, owned. Kisner had a really strong Sunday. Um, he finished in 21st place, 5% owned. Lucas Herbert, 7% owned. He finished in 15th place. And Thomas Detry, uh, who was in my cast lineup too, uh, 8.5% owned, finished in what? 34th place. So, yeah, really, really solid lineup. What do you think? Yeah, uh, I'm never too uh, too negative about winners because they won, and I don't want to be results-oriented. But but that's the difference, too. I also don't want to be – like, I thought it's a pretty aggressive lineup, which is fine. It's You know, you're in a, a tournament. You can play it this way. Just the three with Dietrich, Herbert, and Kisner, like, you know, just to get what you got up top. There was a lot of builds – that you could get there and still be Rory Smith and not have to go here. The one benefit, uh, two things that I will say and give positive feedback on was that one, you avoided uh, the Fox chalk at 7,100 by going down. And two, like the $6,900 guys to me are close enough to the sevens that I guess it's fine. So I don't want to be too hard on him because he won with it. But I also, you know, I don't just say, cause you win, you're the best at golf. Like that's not how it works. It's just, my point would be, it's a bit aggressive, but I, again, it won and I, it's great for him. I'm not going to be, too, too disgruntled with a winner. So overall solid. The Rory Cam Smith was what Mayo had me on his show last week. He said it would be the most popular. It ended up being just behind Rory and X and dropping down. But I, I love the build here where you avoided the 7K range altogether. I will say that. Fleetwood coming through like that. You got T, you T15, T21, and T34 out of your guys. And Dietrich scored with the Eagle and everything. So I think that is where, you know, where the points came from. So I don't hate it. But overall solid. Shout out to Cheech 10, though. Cheech 10 rolled the, the train, fifth, fifth, fifth. Could have just taken down the whole thing, one, two, three. So, Damn. you know, interesting week for that. Uh, we'll add Dr. Rico. We already added to the Tournament of Champions. Get him in the three-man for this week. Congrats overall. Great, great job. But I'm never negative to, towards the winning lineup. I, I just had to call it out this week. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Let's get. Let's finish the open talk, and let's get to – uh, this week's PGA Tour, they heads to Minnesota for the 3M Open. For, I was, it was the Open. 3M Open from TPC Twin Cities. First two years of the event uh, was held here. It was pretty much, you know, supreme birdie fest. Uh, as golfers that, that finished in the top 10 averaged around 23 to 24 birdies for the week. Last year, a little bit more difficult because of windy, firm conditions. Uh, it looks like it'll play somewhere in between this year, uh, between last year and the two years prior. Uh, just because it's supposed to have windier conditions like Thursday afternoon, supposed to be like 20, 25 mile, five miles per hour, Sunday, 20, 25 miles per hour. So it looks like the wind might be there a couple of days, but it's supposed to rain like every day leading up to the event. So that could make it soft uh, and windy. So, you know, last year, windy and firm, you know, the years before, soft and not windy. I'm putting it somewhere in between. I think we still see a winning score in the high um, in the high teens uh, is what I would expect this week. Uh, the course has also been used on the senior tour, uh, you know, uh, every year with, they, they crushed it every year with an average winning score of minus 21. Uh, the PGA adjusted the course a bit for the big boys, adding about 300 yards of length, hundred more trees. They cut down a fairway with a little bit. When the seniors played here, the fairway with average was 40 yards. I think right now it's 36 yards. So it's still wide. Um, you know, it's not surprising that the course is played easy uh, as the PGA Tour, you know, they, they like to set up these newer courses as easy as possible also. So that makes sense for the first two years as well. And maybe why they set it up just a little bit more difficult last year, plus the weather, plus the firm conditions uh, in the third year. I know uh, Hollis Kavner said in his interview, pretty famous the, in the inaugural event that, you know, he, he doesn't want the hardest course on tour. Uh, he wants birdies and train wrecks. Uh, this guy, Hollis Kavner, is the 
3M Open Executive. Uh, he says he, we want birdies and train wrecks. Bogies are no fun. Uh, you know, with uh, 27 water hazards on the course, uh, you know, definitely could have some train wrecks uh, here. Uh, it's definitely possible. Uh, now, now let's get to the main part of the course. The Arnold Palmer designed TPC Twin Cities is a 7,450 yard par 71, four par threes, three par fives. The length of the course, a little bit deceiving just because it is at 1,000 feet above sea level, all shots will go a bit farther than normal, which will cut down the actual length of the course. Also, there are many tee boxes in different yardage locations. So the PGA really has free reign on how long or how short they want the course to play each round. Uh, the par fives are on the longer side, but golfers with above average length could reach them in two due to the altitude giving the ball a bit more juice. Par threes will be some of the more hardest, more difficult holes on the course. All but the par three fourth hole will play over 200 yards. The par fours vary in length, uh, two under 400 yards, four between 400 and 450, and five between 550 and 502 yards. Scoring will need to come on these par fours for golfers to be in contention. Uh, of, of the golfers in the top 10 to first two years, the majority shot minus seven or better on the par fours. Last year, the par four scoring wasn't as good overall in the top 10, but it was still strong compared to the field. Now, off the tee, golfers will see tree-lined fairways that are above average in width with fairway bunkers in the landing zones and water in play on many tee shots. Strokes gain off the tee. Looks like it was a fairly important stat in 2019 as eight of the 12 golfers in the top 10 gained at least 2.2 strokes off the tee and Bryson and Wolf finished top two, two of the longest hitters out there. Um, now, two years ago, Thompson and Long finished top two and both weren't anywhere near the top of the field in strokes gain off the tee, but relied heavily on the flat stick. Really, really easy greens to putt on. Uh, okay. Uh, last year, once again, we saw strong off the tee numbers for leaders. So the jury still sort of out on what we really want to look for in golf versus this is relatively new sample size, not that great, but I think, you know, the approach came from like 175 to 200, 200 plus birdie making prowess and good drive percentage. Uh, something I don't really look at too much, but I listened to Andy Lack's podcast uh, this, this app this morning before uh, on the way to work. And he was talking about good drive percentage and how he thinks it would help this course. And it makes sense. Good drive percentage. If you don't really know uh, it's, it's, it's the, it's adding all your fairways hit with um, the amount of green and regulations you have when you don't hit the fairway uh, and why I think that would be important and why he thinks it's important on this course, because, you know, you, you can have, you could be, bad at, at hitting fairways but still have a good drive percentage meaning you're not missing too wildly uh, on the fairways because the thing is if you miss wildly here you're going in the water and that's what you have to avoid so you know you, you take into account say the first guy i'm going to talk about today is tony fina uh, in the last 50 rounds he's like 110th uh, in this field in fairway uh fairways gain but he's like top 15 in this field in good drive percentage meaning you know uh, more often than not He's, you know, missing the fairway, but still being able to put himself in a position to reach the green from where he is. He's not missing so wildly that he's in the water, that he's in some crazy trees or something like that. So I like, I like that. Go check. We talk about Andy's podcast every week, and I think it's one of the best out there. So go and listen to him. He probably explains it a little bit more better than I am. Uh, the trees, not really bunched up like we see on most East Coast Parkland courses, uh, you know, and and, and there's plenty of room between the edge of the fairway and the tree line. And with only two and a half inch rough, you know, it sort of makes it a little bit easier on your, on your, on your off the tee game, because you can still miss by, I'd say about, you know, anywhere from 10 to 30 feet, uh, depending on, on the hole and still be away from the trees. So that's another thing. No, you, you, you can't miss 10 to 30 feet into the water. That's the only issue uh, you're going to have. On approaches, golfers are going to see greens that are above average in size. Greens are fairly flat, surrounded by rough bunkers and water, uh, with uh, most having a runoff area only in the front of the greens. Uh, the grass on the greens, pure bank grass, stint meter rating around 12. Don't have to worry too much about uh, around the green stuff. Putting, super easy here. 
you know, it could turn into a putting contest if it comes down to it, which we saw basically what when Long uh, and Thompson played a couple of years ago. Go ahead, Tambo. Okay, I was going to say that, yeah, if you're passing it to me, I think that is what we find. That, that's what we're going to see here. Uh, you said jury's out on it a little bit. I think you're right, but then you nailed it with what you said. I think, you know, I, jury duty today came through, told me those same things. Birdies, uh, longer irons, you know, the approach in general, like you said, just all that stuff. I think that's what it always comes down to here, and I think it's what it's going to continue to come down to here, and that's sort of how it shakes out. It's funny, if you look last year, actually, a couple just tidbits out of the gate. Last year, I think it was – only six of the top 20 was surprisingly. I know there's all the power fives here, still not as many as next week, but just in general, a lot of power fives out there. Only six of the top 21 had, had a Eagle last year, just surprisingly enough. It was all just, again, when you have chances at Eagles, you make more birdies. That's where they come from, but the obvious, but my point would be uh, it's surprising that there was just not that many Tringali actually had two Eagles last year in that mix as well. So it's just funny the way it shakes out. And then the other thing, don't forget about this, Kenny, this is random has nothing to do with it, but just the thing as I was doing my back dating, my, like, like my, uh, my research for the week, if you will remember last year, Hank Lebiota, 30% owned shoots a 69, 69. And then we get the WD notice. And we're like, what the fuck? Like, how is he leaving the tournament shooting that? But he had, he had personal reasons that he had to leave. So, uh, you know, wild year here last year, just thinking about that back to it, but uh, a lot of scoring, like you said, and just looking at it in general. The other thing, last thing before we hop into these tiers, the pricing is fucked. Like, I don't know if it's because it's MLB All-Star Week, so they just want to make sure everyone dials in. Like, it's it's not only is it soft, it's just the weirdest setup I've ever seen. I've never seen it that I can even remember. I post this out on Twitter today, but when's the last time you remember there only being seven guys over 9K? And I normally target there, seven guys in the 9K, 9 to 10 normally talking like 13 to, to 15 guys. Yeah, and you could have yeah. pushed some, I just don't understand. They put so many in the sevens and six. There's guys that are like 35 or 40 to one, 40 or 45 to one, I should say, in the 7K, low 7K range. And then on top of it, Fina is like 10 to one in some places, 12 to one. And they just chucked them there at 10, five, like no big deal. So I, I don't know. It's going to be a fun week. We'll talk some strategy, I guess, when we get into it here, but I, what, how do you want to do this nine K and up? Because we're yeah, not just going to talk about the three dudes. I mean, yeah, yeah. Nine K and up. I'll go ahead and start this week. This is yeah. wild and crazy shit. Uh, I'll go ahead and start this week. I'm playing Tony Finau as my first cash game cornerstone. Now, like I said, rarely do I play like the most expensive guy uh, in my cash game cornerstone, but he's only 10, six. You can 10, fit five. whoever the hell you want. Yeah. A 10 5, yeah. Or 10 5. You can fit whoever the hell you want. And I think, you know, his stats line up for exactly what I'm looking for. He can hit a long. And I talked about that good drive percentage. Uh, he's been, you know, in this field. So I guess it's sort of, um, you know, you, you have to take it with a grain of salt, but still above average and good drive percentage. And he doesn't hit that many fairways. Gives me hope that he misses enough of the water out there. And the crazy thing is he's second in bogey avoidance in this field also. Uh, you know, uh, proximity, his, his iron proximity for 175 to 200, strong. Everything lines up for him that I'm looking for this week. And I know it's Tony Finau. I'm not going to bet him, but at 10-5, I'll start with him, who I think he has, you know, high upside, uh, you know, for four-year cash lineup. I'm just going to go ahead and start with Tony. Uh, I'll go ahead and start with him. He, you know, he made the cut on a number, had a good Sunday last week. You know, you know, I'm not worried about him coming back. I, I, I worry less about that nowadays, uh, especially with these guys who are a little bit younger and he's not an old man. So give me Tony as my cash game cornerstone uh, to start. Other guys I do like, I like Davis Riley uh, a lot. Once again, at 9K, again, solid, good drive percentage. Um, you know, off the tee, he's strong, avoids the bogeys. Uh, first in birdies are better gain in the last 50 rounds. He's actually my second cash game cornerstone. So the first seven guys, I got two of my cash game cornerstones uh, on there. Other guys that I am going to play, I'm going to play Hadwin. A couple of top sixes here. Uh, you know, uh, and again, the stats line up once again. Uh, really good from 175 to 200. Bogey avoidance is there. Uh, par four scoring, solid. Iron game, really, really strong. Tina Green, top six in the field. You know, birdies, he can go in bunches and he can go low. So I like Hadwin. Um, and then uh, I'm not sure about the rest. Where, are you, where else are you going here? Yeah, the Fina one up top obviously makes a lot of sense. One, one interesting one is like, a, you know, on some of the projection sites out there, like Sungjae really pops. But not only is he not, like he wasn't even good. So, for example, up top, we got Fina, Matsuyama, Sungjae, just using those top three. 
Fino and Matsuyama at least showed something on Sunday. Fino has been playing great the last month, so I can see why the price, the odds, everything. He'll be extremely popular, 30% in some cases. Yeah. I know people are already talking about locking him, just plug and play and figure the rest of the five out for something like the Fantasy Golf World Championship. Like a lot of different conversations around Fino. Matsuyama's interesting in the middle from the stats perspective across the board and still showed it on Sunday. It's just whatever happened the first three days, it, it didn't work out for him. Now there's conversation around him going to live, but it sounds like guys like him, Cam Smith, if any of them even go, it sounds like they sign their deals in advance and they get till the president's cup to, you know, finalize it all or whatever and move across then. So we'll see. But um, Sung Jay is just interesting because when you pull him up, Kenny, this is what I was going to talk about. Feels like he could be a good tournament play, but then you go back and look. So 81st at the open, horrible Sunday, miscut, miscut. His 10th and 15th are at tournaments with, you know, the Memorial and the Schwab, extremely high scoring tournaments, not birdie fests or low scoring or anything. Masters, eighth. Like that's where his best scores are. The farmers, the tougher tracks, not saying he can't do it. It's freaking Sung JM. The guy used to rip up the corn Ferry tour for the most money. It was the web back then. And then on top of it, he won the Shriners just last year. Like I'm not saying it's about that. It's just the guy hasn't been that good. So it's no, like, he hasn't been making very many. I mean, to, to, be the the skill, to be the skill level that he is and yeah. to be 32nd in birdies or better gain in the last 50 rounds in this field is telling. It's you know one tournament, saying? so he can put yeah. it together. But I agree with you. And I, like I said, it just the, the sites that use projections and stuff are going to like him. So we'll see how that shakes out in the he's end. He's second I mean, in my model, but I don't know if I could use him. Yeah, you know, he's third. Uh, he's third for me. And I think, like you said, that's where it becomes interesting. So I'll, I'll decide by Wednesday. I'll do the, I'm doing the, the same live show chat with Mayo this week. I'll be there on Wednesday. I just want we're doing first look. So I wanted to bring that up. And then you go into this next range, like Figala. McNeely, Riley, those are all going to be guys that people want to play because not just FOMO, but they want to get on their guy. And the, this is the most likely spot for a guy like Thigala, McNeely, Riley to break through and get that W. So Who's the lowest owned? It's got to be McNeely, right? I, th I think McNeely. Yeah, just because in models, he'll pop as like the, one of the better in birdies, but he's awful in the other stats. And he was okay. I think he played, I want to say the Cuda. Was he in the, the Barracuda? Over the weekend? Uh, I do not remember. I'm almost positive. Yeah, he was in it. And he was up there in the mix, at least, and then sort of fell apart down the stretch. Yeah, he was. So, uh, Chez, Chez Revy, who's also in the next range, took it down over Laird. Uh, Sundog Monkey, our, you know, we had, we had a nice bet in there. He was in on Laird. I know some others were as well. Uh, did not come through, but paid the full each way. So, that was solid. Had when I liked, though. I'll just finish out there. I like your call on him. I like Riley, obviously. But my, my top right now would be like Finau, Hadwin, Riley. I think and had when I think becomes interesting because he's no one's darling. He almost reminds me, Kenny, of like when HV3 a few weeks back was is RBC Canadian Open. HV3 was ninety seven hundred dollars, and look, it didn't quite work out because shit, you had Finau, JT, Rory, Lowry, every dude was at the top there. But I'm just saying at this price, people just think it's expensive for Hadwin, but he does have the good course history. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the stats, he shows he's got the mid irons. He's 12th in birdies. He's solid in sand, good on approach. Everything yeah. is a that, six in my model. Two yeah. top six is here. So maybe I he mean, does yeah. pick up a little steam. I just feel like Mc, McNeely, Riley, Thigala, Finau, and then taking a stab on Matsuyama or him up top is where people end up going, where at least he gets kept in check. And I do think he's interesting at that price at 9,600, just sitting there. You could even start some lineups off with them. And then lastly, Kenny, before I'll give you the 8K range, just talking back to the original point I made on some strategy stuff, like every lineup can be filled out with these guys. You're going to have to build some lineups that leave salary. And why I say that is because it's levels, right? You start out, everyone uses a top guy or locks Fina or picks a Matsuyama or an M to get different there. What happens if all three of those guys suck, right? Like Fina could come 24th. Matsuyama could come 20th and M could miss the cut. You pro there's another lineup out there that beats you. But for some reason, people think just because the way the pricing is set up, well, if they don't come through. It means you need McNeely, Riley and Hadwin. Well, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't just say because the top three fail, the next three automatically fit to the winning lineup. So you know, don't just say, okay, I'll skip the top and build balanced with all my salary. Yes, you'll do that. But I'm saying you should be wanting to build some lineups with 500 or a thousand on the table where you can easily just get unique in the field. And, and it's just the way it works. Like people just think the price means the result. And that's obviously not true. All right, let's move to this 8K range. My third cash game cornerstone, Brendan Steele at 8,300. Uh, form looking good. I think three straight top 25s. 
uh, coming in. He's had a little bit of a layoff, so it's slightly worried about that. But it's not like he has to go to like, this is not like a thinking man's course or a strategic course. He can just go out there and do his normal thing. You know, it's pretty straightforward and out there uh, for him. Uh, and again, good drive percentage, solid. Uh, and the thing is, you know, he's long and he's somewhat accurate. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about the water with him. Don't have to worry too much about big numbers with him. So I like steel uh, at 8,300. Um, I like Cam Davis. I think he's going to be very, very popular. Brody Fest uh, out here, uh, you know, avoids bogeys. Uh, really good from 175 to 200 and 200 plus. I think he makes a lot of sense. I think he's going to get a lot of run uh, this week, but I think it's well deserved. Uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't quite get him and justify using him in cash. I thought about it, uh, but you know, his his good drive percentage. A little bit worried about that, so we'll have to see. Uh, but I'm I'm still on him. I, I'm going back to Tringali. Uh, one of the better bent grass putters in this field. Uh, and we saw what he did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know that his game is good. You know, I mean, like a win has to be coming for him at some point in time. And it seems like he he's getting close at least a few times a year. Uh, you know, at least a few times this past year, he's been almost there. Uh, I, I, so I'm not going to go off of him uh, at a course where I think he could do just fine with the way his game stacks up. Uh, you know, compared to what the course is providing. Um, so, yeah, I'll go with him. Um, maybe a little bit of Nick Hardy for FOMO because I just think his skill level is so strong. Stats aren't going to 100% line up with everything you like when it comes to Nick Hardy, but I just think skill level-wise, he's so good that that's a good price for someone that talented. Yeah, before I get to this range, Ken, I want to ask you a question. Is the – well, Wiley brought it up on Twitter today. I want to ask you, is the tired narrative a tired narrative? Meaning – Tringali, Finau, Matsuyama, Im, all those guys coming back from Scotland to play this thing. Look, I know it doesn't start till Thursday, but the conversation and some of the talking points right now are pretty straightforward. It's that there's a lot of travel, and then they're coming to a place that's supposed to be just extremely hot this week where there could be some of that sort of jet lag, fatigue, everything that goes with it. But it also, like I said, it could be – I feel like, again, I'm not a pro golfer, obviously, and I suck at golf, but I'm saying if I flew to Scotland tomorrow, I'm pretty sure I could get – you know, play some rounds. I mean, like these guys are professionals. They do this for a living. They do it all the time. So what do you think on that narrative? Sort of, uh, I think Wiley called it strokes gain jet lag. Well, what's your I, I think, I think, I think it's more important. Like if a guy was in contention, like at right. something like that, where like, say, say, I don't know, somebody in contention with Hovland. Was if in Cam the Young was coming back over, you know, people are like, oh, yeah. he's going to win now. Cause he just did uh, that it may affect him more yeah, because, because while he looks good in the field and it looks like it's time to get a, a W here, it would be like, he also just almost won the open. Yeah. So it can affect him. And that, that drains sense. you. I think being a contention drains you a lot more mentally. And I think mentally is more of a factor in these type of, you know, when people have to travel a lot than the physical, because these guys are, are in shape for most of most of the time, most of the time, most of these guys are young enough where it shouldn't bother them. Yeah. Even if they're not saying? in shape, they're conditioned to yeah. what this life entails. Exactly. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you on that. I just, I thought it was a good talking point to bring up just going back to before I get to this 8k range, because it pertains towards it. So the Barracuda, Kenny, uh, Stableford scoring different. I get it. You know, whatever, but uh, Ches Reeve won it. Martin Laird came third. Scott Gachuski, who we'll talk about later in the value plays, was there in fifth. Cam Davis, who's also in this range, in sixth. And then Mav McNeely, who we just talked about in ninth. Other guys like Michael Thompson we'll get to later, Higgs later, Nick Hardy 13th. But a lot of the guys T13 or better, including Nick Hardy, are 8K and up here in this range to 8,900. So um, Davis stands out, like you said. Uh, Tringali stands out. Reby just won. I know that's always a thing, but uh, his price... I don't know what he would have been last week. I didn't follow the field, but in general, he's a little bit more expensive than you would expect, obviously. Um, JT posted. So there's been a long, I mean, no, I don't want to say long standing. That's the wrong word because, you know, it's only whatever, three or four, four years here we're coming up to. But uh, the John Deere Classic is very similar in the sense of field strength, a lot of birdies, TPC, everyone. Bank grass. But yeah, it gets brought into play. Obviously, JT Poston just won that. So keep that in mind with him there. Again, he's another guy traveling back. Crazy enough, though, here's a little a tidbit I had, because we're going to get to, in the 7K range, old Tom Kim, Ju, Ju Young Kim. He had 15 birdies, Kim, and played the weekend. Do you know how many birdies JT Poston had and missed cut? Mm -hmm. 12 oh. birdies. I mean, at that, I mean, again, it's just insane. Like, just to think about from that perspective, Hubbard, 
WD, Hal, WD. If you guys don't know, I'm sure you do by now if you're watching this, but if you don't. Those are earlier when I was doing my research, those were the guys that I wanted to play, so that hurt. Hal, yeah. was, I, I wanted to play CH3 badly. I liked CH3. I think a lot of people did, but for good reason. The guy, yeah, definitely looked good here. Um, Brendan Steele, I'm with you on. I, put, put it this way, too. I'll also say this. I think your cash game cornerstones look phenomenal this week. You haven't got through all of them yet, but usually I got a good sense on them. I feel like these are good ones here. And then Nick Hardy, I love at the bottom. So Hardy, Steele, Poston, Tringali, Davis. That's like where I sit right now. It's sort of five guys in there that I have interest in. And Hardy's a lot more interesting to me than maybe what you even mentioned. Like it's a little FOMO, but the stats line up like birdies, the, the good drives off the tee, um, the mid irons, he's 12th, 175 to 200. Like I see all that, but then it's like, what's really the difference besides people not knowing as much about him or anything on him for the, the first time win and the FOMO stuff. It's kind of the same as got her up down below. And it's kind of the same, to be honest, as some of the guys up top, just, we know a lot more about, Thigala, McNeely, and Riley. Uh, it would not surprise me if Hardy. I think won he's in challenge. that level of talent. There's no doubt. I think he's still forty to one. Like you could, I couldn't even. Like I don't even. I don't love the number on him, but I think he could win. It was just a point of some of the other guys are the same or worse. So yeah, I, I like I like Hardy quite a bit at eight thousand down at the bottom. All right, let's get to the seven K range. My final cash game cornerstone is going to be Adam Svensson. I expect him to be uber popular uh, this week. He's been playing exceptional golf, but like the man is just a birdie king. There's so many birdies, such a strong approach game. The last, I don't know, month and a half, two months, he was playing really, really good golf. Pricing sort of cheap for Svensson. Uh, so I like Svensson. Cash game cornerstones this week. Going to be Finau at 10-5. Riley at 9K. Um, Steele at 8,300. And then um, Svensson at 70. 7,600. I thought it was 7,800. Man, it's cheap. Yeah, Svensson at 7,600 still leaves you like 14,7, uh, 14,6 around there uh, to make the rest of your lineup. Uh, so other guys I do like here in this seven range. Brendan Todd, so accurate off the tee. You're not going to have to worry about too much water with him. Now, can he win? I don't know. Uh, but maybe uh, you know, go out there, no bogeys, throw a top 20 out there. It's not bad for a person at $7,700. Grio. I'm going to be back on Grio. Never play Grio. Uh, but again, he had that really strong finish uh, a couple of weeks uh, uh, within the last month. I think what he finished runner up or uh, top five in some event. It's like played second recently. or third somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Third uh, and, and again, yeah, of course. And then his stats, of course, you know, line up fairly well. These iron games always being his strength, accurate off the tee, good dry percentage, strong. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and give me a little bit of Grio. Um, Give me a little bit of Matthew Naismith. He's going to be a stat darling once again. I think he's top 10 in my model. Uh, and at 7,500, I'll take that with his, you know, top five in stroke skiing approach. Uh, good with 175 to 200. Bogey avoidance still there. A good drive percentage, exceptionally strong. I like Naismith a lot. Um, anybody, who do you like in this top 7K range? Yeah, Grillo, by the way, I forgot. What, it was a second. And it was at John Deere. We just talked about yeah, that. Yeah, there you so, go. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got to like that for sure. Got her up for me at 7,900. Like I said, we, we got made fun of the first time we played him. Ever since then, he's absolutely destroyed and crushed. Played him all those weeks as well. So I uh, don't have any problem going back to the well there. Jason Day, interesting tournament play at 7,800. Again, I don't think he's going to pop in your stats very much, but just in general, we know it's a guy that can get hot at any time, make birdies. So 7,800, I, I don't mind. I like Todd Moore, who you mentioned. Svensson is the big debate because here's the thing about Svensson. He's even gained with the putter now, Kenny. It's like 10 of the last 12 events, including like eight straight or nine straight that he's found the putter. The issue I have is like, just how popular does he get here? When we can talk, I can go on about a bunch of other guys on top of what he shows up on the stats. Like you talk about Neesmith shows very similar stats. Uh, doesn't make as many birdies though. But again, if the putter flips on Svensson, then we, and the putters flips for Neesmith, that could flip off as well. So there's little things there. Wyndham Clark, Still shows up for me, CT Pan to round it out, I guess. And that's sort of where I'm at, uh, 7,500 and above. Who do you like? Keep on going. Keep on going. Yeah, I don't have much more that I got interest in right now. I'll tell you the ones yeah, I do I have. No, that's why I wanted you to go first. <laughs> oh, I, I, mean, I mean, like, I have my stuff already done. So just look at it. I'll give you what I got. But it's surprisingly top heavy there. So if you go down here, Michael Thompson, former winner, you talked about him. Smotherman would just be a take on uh, talent, right? We're betting on the talent. We've, we've watched him for some time now. I think he's an interesting guy. Uh, Gim. And then I talked earlier about Tom Kim. Um, I mentioned him in the sense that two things. One, he'll be popular this week. Two, he made 15 birdies over the weekend. But if you go look, all this stuff, like now everyone's hopping on. And it's not to say just completely hop off, but the point would be more that 
he does, he's not really this birdie maker that we've seen. Like it's a sense of that. We've been, we've been watching him for making us a cut, getting us a top 20 or 25 and using him as a value play to make everything work. I don't think finding value plays this week at a tournament, this high variance with everything going on. And all these guys, like we said, there's only seven guys, nine K and above the eight K had two WDs and there's only a smaller range there anyway. So all the guys are in the seven K. So is he really the absolute value of the slate that you must have projection sites? will say yes. So decide, I'm just saying this is the first look we're going through it. That's why I bring it up. He has not been on fire with the flat stick at any given moment. Like if you go back and look at his stuff, it's like the tougher stuff that he's played in, right? Like the Scottish Open, the U.S. Open, the uh, the Open that we just saw. And these are made cuts. Like, you know, the Scottish Open was special for sure. But what was the winning score? Seven under? E- even if you take the different par out, everything like that. I just think in general, it's a par 70. Uh, it wasn't like a place that you just rip up. It's not a birdie fest. Plus, things can go wrong here. Plus, pe- more people are jumping on. So I'm, I might worry more about him than even like a Svensson that we just talked about. We'll see how it goes as the week goes on. Trying to go through a few more here. Danny Lee surprisingly pops for me for the birdies uh, i'm looking at him tyler duncan outscores his finish, finishing position quite a bit so if you can find him um you know to get him into your lineups i, I don't hate that tom hoagie is the interesting one i'm getting like um jj spawn popper vibes when jj spawn won if you will yeah, but, like you but jj spawn form was so good because i thought about hoagie too because the numbers just right. look so good for this course right but he's been playing so bad it's this just insane like, how that like works so I mean, I mean, bad the, here's the deal, which I, what, what I will say about Hoagie, why I'm not, you know, as in, I'm with you on that, but I wanted to bring this up because I talk about it all the time with Fantasy National. One thing you got to do, right, is you got to pull in the time frame into it because here's the deal. When you have the early season form of a win at Pebble Beach, 14th, 17th, 9th at the PGA Championship, 30th at the Masters Players and, and Palmer, and then you play seven events where you miss the cut, your last 50 rounds will still look pretty good because all those missed cuts are only two event rounds that you played, two, two round events, sorry, I should say, that you played. So that's where you got to be careful with looking at the most recent top, like the top 50 rounds because all the stats and numbers are typically being pulled from the times that were when it was going well for him. So keep that in mind. Steven Yeager, any birdie fest, I like him. Adam Shank, the same. And then Patton Kazire is also right there at 7,100. He's another guy I think is a more of like a top 20, top 30 type play, but to round out your lineups at 7,100, uh, I don't hate it. And I actually bet him at 90 to one today. So, um, you know, just think about that. Maybe it was a hundred. I have to go look, but yeah, cause I to round it out. What do you got? Yeah. I think the one guy that people aren't going to play, maybe like a, a, a definite flyer out here. It's going to be under 5% on that. I like is Hayden Buckley again, talent wise. We saw what he did in the fall swing. I mean, he was like, you know, two, three events in a row, top 10, top 15. You know the skill is there. Top three and good drive percentage on the season uh, on tour, uh, not just like in the field, but like on tour. Uh, I think he was third in a good drive percentage. Uh, you know, just someone out there is going to be 2% owned. As you can go out, take a flyer on the might win you GBP. Uh, so I'll take a little bit of Hayden Buckley. Um, I like Tyler Duncan a lot. I like Nate Lashley. Duncan, you already talked about Lashley. Uh, seems to make a lot of sense. Again, another guy, tons of birdies, really strong, good drop percentage, really solid bogey avoidance. Lashley, another guy, might go single digit owned again, five, six percent, could win you a GBP. I like Lashley uh, a lot. Um, you know, other guys, uh, Thompson makes sense. Grayson Sig is a sundog monkey pick of the week. You know, you gotta, he would say, uh, Martin had uh, Cam Smith last week, so maybe he can go on a heater. And this is just based on what he said. So I'll throw in some Grace and Sig uh, out there. Callum Tarum seems like there's a lot of – he's a very good player. Uh, 7K, again, I think you can get a flyer on him uh, real cheap and real low owned. Uh, and then, you know, that's that's probably about it there. If you go down to the 6K range, Sam Ryder sticks out. Sam Ryder, birdie fest. Give me, give me all the Sam Ryder at a birdie fest whenever we can. Give me Sam Ryder. 6,900, birdie fest. Ryan Armour, again, good drop percentage, accurate off the tee. Don't have to worry about water too much. Has played well here in the past. Brian Stewart, sort of the same mold. 6,600, another guy, a similar type uh, type deal with Ryan Armour. Uh, and then Bo Hogue, you know, a couple of oh, top 20s here uh, in his two chances here and then basically sucks everywhere else. There's like a couple of courses where Bo Hogue balls out at. This is one of them. Uh, you know, so so I could try a little bit of Boho 
at 6,800, but you're really, you know, grasping at straws uh, when you get to the 6K range. Uh, on this top of the six, well, who do you like in the 6K range? Uh, what, what I forgot, just to going back right quick to seven, even you mentioned him as Lashley. Uh, again, he, he's interesting because he's a guy that never gets ownership, no matter what. People could talk him up. People would say he's the greatest player on earth. You mentioned he usually comes in at like five, six percent or less. So, uh, and there's just too many guys in the seven K range. So I think he gets overlooked. So I like him there. Uh, Bramlett was another one right at seven. Dropping down, you you mentioned Bo Hogue. I like him. He pops for me. Andrew Novak, another guy that pops for me there. Uh, Austin Cook at sixty seven hundred is an interesting one. And then the, is Grayson Murray going to play this thing or what? He he was caught saying that he's only got a few events left. Sounds like he's going to live, but. Um, uh, you know, especially since they escorted him off the premises last week. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, you know, he, he, he's down there. I just say he will. He does make a lot of birdies. Gachuski, the guy I talked about earlier, uh, just finished fifth at the Barracuda, putting up some pretty good scores and pretty consistent over the week. Good weekend, especially. So I think he's interesting. And then Cole Hammer, if you want to take a, a long shot play down at the bottom at 6,500, probably a little too soon for him, but we, we sometimes take shots on these guys. So, you know, that's just some of the guys down in this range that I think you could take a shot with. All right. Anybody else? No, I think that's it, man. All right. Let's get the bets for this week. I have a few. How about that? First one's going to be uh, Davis Riley, 22 to one Cam Davis, 25 to one Svensson, 40 to one. And then we're going bombs. Duncan, hundred to one Buckley, 130 to one rider 150 to one uh, i'll probably th- throw some more bombs out there as the week goes on yeah i'm definitely gonna throw more out there as the week goes on. i've only got four so uh, i got got her up at 50 i missed the 55 but 50 to one take the shot now I-, I think it's like you said if he does it's gonna be sort of the same situation where it just comes down from there 30 next time or whatever so uh i'm gonna take him at 50 with the each way and try and find something there kazire i mentioned earlier at 90 I think you can find him 100 at some places. I just didn't get the best number, but I took it with eight places. Uh, Callum Taron, like the number on him at 125. I like him at 7K too. I got to decide between the 7K guys. There's just so many of them there. Lashley, Taron, Bramlett, uh, Shank, all those guys I mentioned earlier. And then Bramlett was the other one at 140. I, I had it on Michael Kim at the same number and he WD'd. He ended up um, coming like third at the Corn Ferry Tour event this week. He WD'd because he's going to play in the next corn Ferry tour event this week instead to just lock up his card that way. So mm-hmm. good for, good for him. But uh, the John Deere connection, obviously, and then for that and for how well he's been playing recently, and then they throw out the 140. I, I love that bet. And so I sprinkled some of it on Bramlett and just kept the rest behind. I've only got four bets for right now. All right. So one and done last week, I used Fina. If I didn't, I'd use him this week. Uh, but I used Fina. Thank God he made the cut on, on, on the Friday. On, that he needed. On, oh, yeah. On the last hole on, on 18, on his 18th hole, 36 hole. Uh, played he made the cut and then you know finished top 30 which is better than nothing uh because i was in the top 25 i'm probably still in the top 50 uh, in the carbon cup but i'm thinking i'm going had when around yeah i i like uh i like that i have a like 30 percent that uh nobody has left 30 percent left is a hideki so i'm using hideki All right, take, that take, sounds good take my shot and just see what happens i'm behind and that's a decent enough percentage and i don't think that's where people go so elite talent that who knows what could happen probably doesn't win it but if he did that'd be awesome for that so we'll see all right that sounds good you can find me on twitter at kendo vt you can find my article at gupscorner.com use promo code kenny save yourself 30 percent on a membership to gups corner lots of big winners on gups corner this past week i had a little bit to do with it a little bit but gup is the man out there he does his thing uh he knows what he's talking about it's worth the membership uh use promo code kenny go on gups corner yeah, Gup crushed this week. Shout out to him. He had a, you know, could have been a lot better, but for, I think it was two top 15s in both the, the millionaire makers, like even the big dog 25 and then crushed it in the 44, 44. And he did not have a fantasy golf world championship seat and went out and just said, forget it. I'm going to take the last one on the last day. So he took one of those to round it out. So shout out to him there. That was awesome to see for me. You can find me as always on Twitter at toe tag and Tambo hit me up there. If you guys have any questions, the tidbits will be out as always on Wednesday morning. So check that out. Just all the stuff I round up from around the industry, the free content, put it together in one place for you guys curated out. So you guys can check it out over at Rumpier sports. Of course, talk about all the time, but rumpiersports.com. You can use promo code DGEN50, DEGEN50, get yourself 50% off your first month. That's all sports. One price. Check it out. Get in the Discord. A lot of stuff going on. MLB's on a break right now, but there's all the other sports that you can check out there and get into the mix. So that's all I got for this week, Kenny. 
All right, that sounds good. A little bit of a letdown, but you know what? We're fucking degenerates. We ball out every fucking week. Let's make some motherfucking money, DJ Nation. I've been getting dirty money, Jordan Belfer. Stacking penny stock.